So just to review, if we have two areas of electrons around the central atom, then we have a prototype shape. You can think about two balloons tied together, forming a linear shape. And we have two unhybridized p orbitals, orthogonal to the hybridized orbitals. The two linear hybridized orbitals are called sp hybridized orbitals. And they're formed when an s orbital and a p orbital are combined to form two new energetically equivalent sp hybridized orbitals. If we have three areas of electrons around the central atom, think of three balloons tied together forming a triangular plane. And perpendicular to that plane is an unhybridized p orbital. The hybridization there is what happens when an s orbital and two of the three p orbitals combine. So you have three new equivalent sp2 hybridized orbitals forming. Each one of these purple orbitals in the triangular plane are sp2 hybridized orbitals. If we have four areas around the central atom, then we have four balloons tied together in the shape of a tetrahedron. That's the most stable shape. And the hybridization there is when an s orbital and three p orbitals combine to form four new energetically equivalent sp3 hybridized orbitals. Now, we've also seen what happens with expanded octets. They do not occur in the second period because there's no d orbitals to become involved in the hybridization. But once you get beyond the second period, the third, the fourth, etc., you have d orbitals as well, and one or two of them can join the hybridization process. So if we have five areas around the central atom, think of a triangular bipyramid, five balloons tied together. And that occurs when a 3s orbital, three of the 3p orbitals, and a d orbital are all combined to form five new energetically equivalent hybridized orbitals, and those orbitals are called sp3d hybridized orbitals. Finally, if we have six areas around the central atom, the prototype shape is going to be octahedral. Think of six balloons tied together. The most stable shape is going to be looking like this. And that occurs when a 3s orbital, three of the 3p orbitals, and two of the three d orbitals are all combined to form six new energetically equivalent sp3 d2 hybridized orbitals. So you need to know the hybridization of each one of these prototype shapes. So now we're going to talk about molecular orbital theory. And in this theory, we apply Schrodinger's wave equation to the entire molecule to calculate a set of what's called molecular orbitals. And this is different from valence bond theory, where we just looked at individual atomic orbitals. Here we look at the entire molecule. And the way this is done is through a method called the linear combination of atomic orbitals. It's the weighted sum of all the atomic orbitals making up the molecule. And because orbitals are wave functions, when you combine them, they can combine either constructively or destructively. When wave functions combine constructively, the resulting molecular orbital has less energy than the original atomic orbitals. And it's called a bonding molecular orbital. And there are two types of these bonding molecular orbitals, a sigma bonding orbital and a pi bonding orbital. And most of the electron density is between the nuclei. Now, when the wave functions combine destructively, the resulting molecular orbital has more energy than the original atomic orbitals. And it's called an antibonding molecular orbital. 
these work against stable bonding. And the designation for the two types is sigma star and pi star, designating the antibonding sigma molecular orbital and antibonding pi molecular orbital. Here, most of the electron density is outside the nuclei and lie in nodes between the nuclei. So looking at the interaction of two atoms, each with a 1s atomic orbital, if they combine constructively, you get the sigma 1s molecular orbital, and that's a bonding molecular orbital. And if they combine destructively, you get an anti-bonding molecular orbital or a sigma star molecular orbital. The bonding molecular orbital favors bonding. The destructive interference pattern and the anti-bonding molecular orbital that results inhibits the formation of a molecular bond. Electrons in bonding molecular orbitals are stabilizing because they have lower energy than the atomic orbitals. And electrons in anti-bonding molecular orbitals are destabilizing. They, have, they are higher in energy than atomic orbitals. The electron density is located outside the internuclear axis. And electrons in anti-bonding orbitals cancel stability gained by electrons in bonding orbitals. Now, there are certain properties that can only be determined with molecular orbital theory. Bond order is equal to one half the difference between the number of electrons in bonding and antibonding orbitals. Here we only consider the valence electrons, and the bond order may be a fraction. The higher the bond order, the stronger and the shorter the bonds. And if the bond order is zero, the bond is unstable and no bond will form. So we calculate bond order like this, the number of bonding electrons minus the number of antibonding electrons divided by two. A substance will be paramagnetic if its molecular orbital diagram has unpaired electrons in it. If all the electrons are paired, it is diamagnetic. So let's take a look at how we use atomic orbitals to combine them and form molecular orbitals. Here are two hydrogen atomic orbitals. One hydrogen atom has this atomic orbital, another hydrogen atom has this atomic orbital, and the two atoms form a covalent bond and form a molecule of H2. So what we're going to do is combine the atomic orbitals, and when we do that, they will combine constructively and form a bonding orbital and destructively and form an antibonding orbital. Now we have two electrons to work with. I, this hydrogen atom is 1s1. In other words, one electron in this atom, one electron in this atom. And we're going to take both of those atoms from the two hydrogen atoms and put them together in the sigma molecular orbital for H2, the molecule H2. We've used up all the electrons. There are no electrons that will go into the antibonding sigma star molecular orbital. Now, since more electrons are in the bonding orbital, then in an antibonding orbital, there is a net bonding interaction. Let's figure out the bond order now, okay? Remember, bond order is the number of bonding electrons minus the number of antibonding electrons divided by two. So if we do that, we have two electrons in a bonding orbital, zero in an antibonding orbital, divided by two, the bond order is one. So we have one bond between the two hydrogen atoms. As far as magnetic properties go, both of these electrons are paired. There are no unpaired electrons. Therefore, the hydrogen molecule is diamagnetic. Now, let's do a similar analysis using two helium atoms. Here's one helium atom, two electrons in a 1s, 
another helium atom to electron in its 1s. We combine them. We now have four electrons total. When we combine them, we have a sigma bonding orbital and a sigma star antibonding orbital. We have four electrons to put into these. Two go into the sigma, and then we're forced up to the higher energy antibonding orbital, and two electrons go in the antibonding orbital. Now, since there are as many electrons in an antibonding orbital as in bonding orbitals, there is no net bonding interaction. Helium does not form He2. There's no bond there. And the bond order is going to be 1 half of 2 for bonding minus 2 antibonding, which is going to be 0. The bond order for the molecule helium-2 is 0. OK, now let's take two lithium atoms and combine them to form dilithium Li2. We have two electrons in the 1s and one electron in the 2s for one lithium atom, the same for another lithium atom. When we combine the 1s orbitals of these two atoms, we get the pattern as we have already seen for helium and hydrogen. We get a sigma bonding orbital and a sigma star bonding orbital. We are bringing two electrons from one atom and two electrons from another atom in the 1s orbitals. That's four total electrons, and four total electrons are going into our sigma and sigma star molecular orbitals. Now, in the 2s shell, we have one electron for one lithium atom, one electron in another lithium atom. If we combine these 2s orbitals, we get a molecular orbital, again a sigma orbital and a sigma star. And we put both of these into the sigma 2s bonding orbital. Now take a look at this, and you'll see that we have more electrons in bonding orbitals than in antibonding orbitals. And therefore, there's a net bonding interaction. If we want to calculate the bond order, you have to realize that you know we can ignore what's happening in the inner 1s area forming 1s sigma and sigma star any filled energy level will generate filled bonding and antibonding molecular orbitals and therefore we only need to consider what's happening at the valence shell level so essentially what i'm saying is we can ignore this when we calculate bond order. And the bond order is going to be 1 half of 2 in a bonding orbital, 0 in an antibonding orbital. The bond order is 1. It turns out p orbitals can be combined in one of two ways. They can combine end to end. And when they do that, they form sigma bonds, because end to end overlap leads to sigma bonds. And they will form a bonding orbital, sigma 2p, and an antibonding sigma star 2p. That would happen with one of the three p orbitals we have to work with, the px, let's say. Okay, one px, another px, overlap side by side, end up with sigma 2p x and sigma star 2p x. Okay, but we know also that p orbitals can overlap side by side. Let's take a PY and another PY and combine them side by side. And when they are combined this way, we don't get sigma molecular orbitals. We get pi molecular orbitals, a bonding one and an antibonding one. So this is pi 2p. This is pi star 2p molecular orbital. We have one more p orbital to work with, the one coming out of the plane the PZ, and that also is going to overlap side by side to form pi 2PZ and pi star 2PZ. So when we take all these atomic orbitals, combine them for molecular orbitals, there are two patterns of energy levels that emerge. And we don't need to go into the reasons why there are two different patterns of energy levels. But 
it's not as bad as it looks because you're going to be given the energy levels, these energy levels, at the back of the test. You're not going to be given the little boxes, but you will be given the energy levels. The determinant factor on which pattern we're going to use rests on the number of valence electrons that we're working with. Up to 10 valence electrons in our molecular orbital, we use this energy pattern. And greater than 10 valence electrons in our molecular orbitals leads to this energy pattern. So let's start filling these up. First, let's work with diboron, B2. Now, how many electrons do we have to work with? The valence number of boron is 3 for each one. B2 is therefore going to have 6 valence electrons. If we include the 1s electrons, it's going to have 4 more than that. So there are two ways to do this. We can just ignore, completely ignore the 1s level because that is not going to involve any calculations of bond order. Uh, and we can just work with valence electrons starting at n equals 2. Or we can use all the electrons in the molecular orbital, including the 1s, and that's going to fill up the sigma 1s and the sigma star 1s. Students routinely mix up the two and routinely fall into the trap of using the wrong number of electrons in this. So let's, since the sigma 1s and sigma star 1s are here, we'll use all the electrons for boron 2. That's going to be uh, 10 electrons total. Going to be 6 valence electrons and 4 in the 1s level. And when we put those in, it's going to look like this, All right? So let's count our electrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So boron is number 5. There are two of them. That's 10 electrons. Here are 10 electrons. If we just use B2's 6 valence electrons, 3 and 3, then we'd have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we'd just ignore this. All right, how about C2, dicarbon? What's that going to look like? Well, carbon is number 6. If we have two of them, that's 12. So we start to fill them in. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And it would look like that. For nitrogen, nitrogen's number 7. Each has 7 electrons. That's 14 for both of them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Now, nitrogen has 5 valence electrons. 2 nitrogens has 10 valence electrons. So we're at the end of this pattern. And as soon as we go to dioxygen, we have more than 10 valence electrons. Oxygen has a valence number of 6. Two of them is 12. That's greater than 10. So we're over here using this energy pattern. Altogether, oxygen is got 8 electrons total, or 16 for O2. And therefore, it's going to look like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Fluorine is going to bring two more electrons to this. And finally, neon, too, is going to fill in the pattern this way. Now, from this, for each one of these, you can figure out a bond order. And again, the way I would do it is just forget about the 1s level and just count your bonding and antibonding electrons in the valence 2s level or 2p level, anything above the 1. So diboron is going to be, let's see, 4 minus 2, 4 electrons in bonding, 2 in an antibonding, 4 minus 2 is 2 times a half. So that's um, a bond order of 1 for B2, bond order of 2 for C2, and so forth. Also, do you see here in diboron and dioxygen that we have unpaired electrons? That makes these molecules paramagnetic. 
Just a quick shot to show you what paramagnetism means. If we take oxygen, liquid oxygen, and pour it into a very strong magnetic field, you see that it is attracted to the magnetic field. So this is one way that molecular orbital theory helps to predict reality because neither Lewis theory or valence bond theory predicts this result. Okay, with that, that's the end of chapter 10.